such an honor and a privilege to be hanging with you guys. Man, it's always good to be back home. I just, I just love it here. I love you guys. It's been too long. It's been too long. Um, I just want to say that um, my wife and I and, and, and our church, man, we're just so grateful for National Community Church, for your prayers, for your investment, for your visits. A few of you have come and, and uh, hung out with us. And hey, speaking of, um, here's some information on the screen. You can come hang out with us. Um, take down the address, follow us uh, on Instagram, kind of check out what's, what's happening. And uh, the food scene in, in Baltimore is pretty good. So you can come. We start at 11, then it's around brunch time. You know, it won't keep you too long. And then you can just, you know, tour the city a little bit. But, hey, I just, I just want to thank you guys so much and it just invite you guys to just come and, uh, and spend some time with us if you don't mind. If you have a Bible, love for you to meet me in Acts chapter number 10. Uh, we will get there in just... Uh, a moment, we'll get there eventually. But first, um, I brought a picture that I wanted to show, share with you. Uh, Pastor Mark said last week that we should carry around a picture of our five-year-old selves, you know. And so, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not really related to my message. Um, I just thought I would, I would participate, you know, uh, show y'all the young stunner, you know. Uh, that would be 83, 84, you know, Gloria Florida Elementary School. Shout out to Miami, Florida. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's it. I don't have nothing else related to that. <laughs> but speaking of flashing back, though, um, do you guys remember what was happening or what you were doing um, August 17th, 2021? No, actually, I got that wrong. August 21st, 2017. I can't even remember the date, so you know I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> but um, I didn't recall what was going on uh, on that date until recently. And what was going on was actually a total solar eclipse. First time a total solar eclipse uh, could be witnessed across the continuous United States from coast to coast for 99 years. So I think the last time was like June of, of 1918. Now, as remarkable as that was, it's also related to what Pastor Mark was talking about last week. I love how author and pastor Taylor uh, Staten put this in his book um, that he recently wrote about prayer. And he was talking about this, this moment. And this is what he said. I just want to read what he said to you. He said, when the eclipse actually happened, I was walking down 23rd Street, a particularly buzzing thoroughfare of Manhattan's west side. 23rd Street runs through the heart of Chelsea, home to New York's upscale gallery, art galleries, independent theaters, and most iconic hotel. But it's also a transportation hub, close enough to Times Square to attract tourists, and chain stores, and plenty of hyper-busy, perpetually angry New Yorkers <laughs> trying to get from A to B. It was one of those New York moments I remember forever. People were stopped all over the side while passing glasses back and forth. Everyone talking to one another like little kids. Sophisticated New Yorkers momentarily returning to their inner child at a science museum on a fourth grade Field trip. I love this description that Tyler gives to us because I think it's an example of what Pastor Mark preached about last week when he talked about holy curiosity. But it was this, this holy curiosity that also stirred up a holy moment of unity. Because there was something bigger happening in our world, something bigger going on around us. And if we kind of broaden this description out a little bit, perpetually angry people, self-absorbed, trying to get from point A to point B. I'm not worried about what's going on over here. I'm not worried about what's going on over here. I just need to get to this point here. I'm only worried about me, myself, and I. Is that not the world we live in every day? Is that, is that not like our, our, our norm? 
But every now and then, when we get past just trying to build our personal kingdom and, and our personal agendas that we're focused on, every now and then God taps us on the shoulder and shows us something bigger, something greater. We're drawn in by his workmanship. We're, we're drawn in by his artistry and what he's doing in the world around us. And every now and then it shows us that we are all connected to one another. We all belong to one another. It's called a holy moment. And just to give you one more to drive this point home, um, just 83 days ago from today, January 2nd, 2023, my wife Eric and I headed down to South Beach, you know, headed home, hang out a little bit, We're kicking off the new year right, you know. Flight was delayed a little bit, but we got there and... Um, Got, got a car and, and, and arrived on South Beach and arrived at the restaurant. And as I'm getting out of the car, it's right around uh, just before 9 p.m., uh, my, my phone just begins to, to, to buzz and, and buzz and buzz and buzz. And, and it's a, a group chat of guys that, that I'm in. That, and, and I'm trying to figure out, my wife is trying to order, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. It was the day or the evening when Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin collapse on the field. And as a former NFL player, I, I don't think I was prepared for what that would do in me and, and the emotions that it stirred in me once I got to my hotel room and, and I began to process like what, what the guys might be feeling and, and what that must be like. No, we had never seen anything like this happen before. And thank God DeMar is, is, is fine and he's, he's, he's recovering. But in that moment, it didn't matter who your team was. It didn't matter if you even liked football or not. It didn't, it didn't even matter about the game being played at that point. Everyone is concerned about this young man's life. Whether you even believed in God whether you prayed, what your affiliation was, none of those things mattered. But you know what I remember? I remember people rallying. I remember people hoping. I remember people praying. As a matter of fact, even members of the media, I remember guys on ESPN openly praying out loud to God on air. I don't remember people talking about separation of church and state. Maybe they were. I don't, I don't remember that. And yes, it was a chilling moment. But you know what else it was? It was a holy moment. It was a moment where God was showing us that there's something bigger and there's something greater and we're all connected to one another. And this reminds me of my, one of my favorite passages of scripture in Acts chapter number 10 that, that really inspires me and continues to fuel me to this day. The spotlight is on two guys in Acts 10. A guy named Peter who is uh, a Jew and he is one of Jesus' homeboys, you know, one of his closest disciples. And then we got this guy named Cornelius who is a centurion, which means that he's a soldier in, in, the, in the Roman uh, army. And uh, these are two guys that wouldn't be hanging out with each other. They're not boys. They're not friends. They're from separate sides of the track, whatever you want to call it. Like, they are not going to be hanging out together. You, know, you just know some people, you just, they just not going to be hanging out together. That's, 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 that's Peter and Cornelius. But they both had one thing in common. They were men of God who prayed regularly. And so one day, both of these men were praying. And Cornelius is, is over in his spot doing his thing, and, and Peter's over in his spot doing his thing, and they're probably about a three days journey away from each other. So they're not down the street, you know. But they both were praying around the same time. And so God gives Cornelius a vision in prayer and said, hey, uh, Cornelius, there's a, there's, a, there's a guy over in... Um, uh, this, this spot called Joppa, I want you to send some folks over there and, and, and get him. His name is Peter. This is where he's staying. Um, go knock on his door and, and, and ask Peter to, to, to come. 
So, you know, Kenia is like, all right. So he, he, he does what God asked him to do. And around the same time, Peter is praying. And Peter, um, it says he, he gets a vision. They were preparing some food. And so, man, maybe he's like, Lord, I just, I, I'm hungry. And, and, and maybe that caused him to have a vision. And then he had a vision of food. <laughs> but, but in the vision, like, he sees all of these animals that were forbidden for Jews to eat. And God says to him, I want you to kill and eat. And Peter's like, yo, hold up. <laughs> like, I'm sanctified, bro. Like, that's, we, don't, we don't eat that. I would never eat anything that is unclean. And God says to him, what I call clean, you do not call unclean. You do not call impure. And it says that God said to, this to him three separate times. So he's going back and forth with God, and then God said, okay, hold on. Listen, there's going to be some guys coming. They, they come into the house. They're they going to knock on the door, and um, they want to see you. I've sent them. You just, you just chill. Just go with them. So they knock on the door, and they talk to Peter, and, and Peter's like, okay, I, yeah, I knew you guys were coming. And it says that Peter went with them to Cornelius' house. And here is where the story picks up in verse 28. So Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, and Cornelius is waiting for him. It says, Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. Well, hello to you too, bro. I mean, like, what kind of hello is that? I, I mean, that's just straight disrespectful. <laughs> but I digress. You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask you why you sent for me. I mean, he could have started there. But I digress. Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon, whose also name is Peter, here. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good for you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Whenever we see these moments of unity and they inspire us and they, they fill us with hope, those are holy moments. And this is what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 10. This is a holy moment because these cats would not be hanging out with each other. This is totally a God thing. But you know what's really interesting to me as I, like, really examine Peter's response here and, and, and his, his conversation? I'm, I'm struck by a few things. I'm struck by how he's just now having this aha moment and now I see moment. Because let's think about it. This is, this is Peter who's been hanging with Jesus for three years. Like, he's been, he been living with him, eating with him, like seeing Jesus do his thing. And here's the thing about this. He saw Jesus touching lepers. Nobody touched lepers. Nobody hung out with them. They were unclean people. As a matter of fact, they couldn't even live in the city. They had to live outside the city walls, just in a community of lepers. And, oh, by the way, when they walked near people, they had to announce to everyone that they were unclean. And Jesus is touching them, hanging with them. He saw Jesus talk to women. You didn't do that. That was improper to do. But he saw Jesus 
do this. He saw Jesus eat lunch with, with hated people. And even the religious leaders was like, yo, listen, I don't know what's up with this dude. We don't eat with those people. We don't, we don't, we don't talk to those, those people. They have problems. And then he also, he also saw Jesus tell children to come to him. And that might not seem like a big deal because kids are just the apple of our eyes now. And I love these photographers on Instagram who, who can prop the babies up and they, their face look, you know, like, yes. But, but you, know, you know why that is? It's because Jesus gave them value. Amen. Because they didn't have value in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, it would not have been uncommon to throw a child onto the trash heap if they had a defect or something was wrong. Can you imagine walking down the street, seeing a child, a baby, thrown away? So Jesus is giving people value who were not valued. And, oh, by the way, by the way, just in case you miss all of that, Peter, then you got the Great Commission, right? Teach and make disciples of all nations. Everybody. So I'm just like, hold on, bro, hold on. What do you mean, now I see? What you been looking at? But you, you, know, you know what this tells me? This tells me that Peter, who loves God, that Peter, who is a devout follower of Jesus, there's still something off about the lens through which he sees the world. And you know what? Before we start, like, criticizing Peter, before we start looking down on Peter, all of us is, is Peter. All of us. Got a little bit of Peter in us. Our lens is just a little bit off. And then, like, let me just, let's just flash back to Peter. Because Peter, like, he had to get regularly rebuked. You know, like, Peter was just that dude. Peter's a wild guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think Pastor Donald was talking about how, like, it, Jesus, like, yo, Pete, yeah, get behind me, bro. Like, follow, follow me, you know? Like, Peter was always having to get rebuked because Peter regularly needed lens adjustment. And see, I think... I think many of us are the same way because I, for those of us who, who do follow Jesus, for those of us who do have a little bit of an idea of, like, you know, God's kingdom, you know, including everyone and, and all this, I, I think that we have a good idea of a representation of God's kingdom, but our relationships don't reflect it. I'm going to say that again. I think we have an idea of what, what represents God's kingdom, but our relationships don't reflect it. And you know why? We, it, it, it's because uh, the, the, the psychology of comfort. Our psychology is outweighing our theology. Like, like this psychology of comfort, and, and even, even our biology is outweighing our theology because, like, that doesn't feel, the gospel doesn't feel good to live out. Because if we are left to our own devices, we will always choose to be comfortable. But, 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 I got good news. I got good news. There's one thing that changed the game. One. One factor that changed the game. And that's, that's just what I want to talk to you about the rest of my time. Prayer, if you're taking notes, prayer is the only thing that can shift our hearts and change how we see. Like regular prayer. Just like a regular diet will change your biology and change your body and change your health. Like, it needs to be regular, not like a salad every now and then. <laughs> like, regular prayer is what changes our hearts and changes the lens through which we see. Peter shows us, Peter shows us that personal experiences alone can't do that because he had personal experiences. He saw Jesus do it. 
But it's clear by Peter's words, especially when he just rolled up to Cornelius' house. I mean, like, it's clear through his words that the superiority of the Jewish culture was embedded in his heart. And I would say the same thing for Cornelius. I'm sure he got some superiority stuff going on in him. I mean, like, he's a part of, like, who's in control in, in Rome, and, 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 and he's got influence. He's got power. We, we all got this superiority stuff in us. We, we've got some aspect of our lives and some aspect of our culture that we think is superior or we think is better or we, we don't say it, but we're like, yeah, they got it wrong. Uh, they, got, they, got it, they got it wrong. And here's the other thing. I, I, I think that we lack humility in ourselves. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is like a mirror. And when we're praying, it allows us to see ourselves if we're doing it regularly. Now, I just want to show you this diagram, all right? I'm going to throw this diagram up because this, this is the main thing that I want, I want to talk about today, right? So, so here's the thing. We start off here. Prayer increases our proximity to God. It's, it's not just about having a conversation. It's just not about placing our order, all right? It increases our proximity to God, which, which then helps us to understand how we can commune or be with God. That's, that's what this is. And then when we're doing that regularly, you know what it does? It, it checks our hearts, and it, it helps our hearts to grow in intimacy with God. So we're praying regularly, we're, we're, we're spending time, we're communing with, and it influences our heart. I'm going to stop right there because what we give attention to, what we give time to has influence over us. And so if the research is correct, which I don't doubt it because, I, you know, I struggle a little bit with it myself and, and I live in a house with teenagers, but we're giving a whole lot of time and attention to social media. We're giving a whole lot of time and attention to stuff that is influencing us, and we don't think that it is. And we're more intimate with that than we are with this. All right, let me keep going. So prayer increases our proximity to God. That's, that's our communion. And then it, it, it influences our, our heart and, and helps our heart to grow in intimacy with God. But then this is the, this is the big out, output right here. It then causes our empathy to grow towards one another. Listen, I, don't, I, I really don't know how you're going to grow your own empathy without prayer. Because you know what? People are just hard to love. They, <laughs> they get on your nerves. They just do stuff that don't make sense. Like, you, you know, you, you just, you, you have to pray regularly. Like, like some, some people, you just have to pray that, Lord, just help me say good morning. <laughs> and even if I can't say good, help me say morning. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to grow closer to one another without prayer. Listen, programs can't do it. Processes that, that, that look good, drawn up, that they can't do it because, like, we need this right here checked. We need, we need, we need this worked on right here. Listen, Cornelius, it says in, in verse 3 in Acts 10, it says that he did charitable works towards the Jews. So he was, you know, he was kind of cool with them. He, you know, he was nice to them. It says, yeah, and we talked about Peter, you know, and like his, his interaction. Peter, wild dude, you know, like Peter had a little bit different interactions. I mean, he cut people's ear off and all this sort of stuff. And God's like, Jesus like, Peter, chill, bro. Just, just put the man's ear back. But, but, but they, 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 they have had interactions with, with one another, right, with, with, with the different groups. But, but here's the thing. I think they understood cordiality, but they likely had little experience with unity across dividing lines. See, I think we've learned how to be cordial. I think we've learned how to be politically correct. I don't think we really learn or have enough experiences of stepping into someone else's world and experiencing them and at least listening and being present. But here's the thing. A devotion to prayer for these two men changed that. 
Because it's not just about, like, our situation and the stuff that we're trying to get worked out. Like, prayer is a two-way thing where God's trying to do some stuff in us. So prayer changes our hearts. And I would argue that one of the reasons why we're seeing so much disunity amongst people who say they follow Jesus is because we ain't praying. Y'all think, like, the... The, the, the thing that we started here at, at NCC, House of Prayer, you think we just want to just do that just to just do it? No. Like, we need to be coming together to pray for and with one another. We can't have sustained holy moments of unity. We, we, we can have moments of unity, but it, but it won't be sustained without intimacy with God. I love what Tyler Staten says in, in, in his book, um, praying, like, uh, praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, highly recommended. He says, when our trust in God is fractured, so is our intimacy with one another. This is a key point here because it was Cornelius' and Peter's trust in their relationship with God that allowed them to step into this uncomfortable moment. Again, it was their trust in their relationship with God that allowed them to step into this uncomfortable moment. And it was a risk for both of them to do this because it was, it was unlawful. It was, it was unlawful according to the, to the Jewish law. And then, like, culturally, like, man, that just, you just didn't do that. that. That was kind of maybe an unspoken kind of deal culturally. You know, we got all those kind of things going on. And the thing that stops us is I think we're too busy looking at obstacles and outcomes. But all God cares about is obedience. Because that's the only success metric is obedience. Because the outcome belongs to God. That's his to work out. So we don't have to sit down and process, and if I do this, if I say this, or what about this, or what about... No, God is asking us to be obedient and follow him. He'll take care of everything else. And this is what we saw with Cornelius and Peter. Like, they just followed, and God took care of the rest. I think we're robbing ourselves of holy moments with him and with one another because we're not fully submitted consistently to God in prayer. Let, let me see if I can bring this in for a landing for us. Um, one of my favorite moments that's been a part of this church is a conversation that I had with my friend David Grizzle. Some of y'all know who David is. David's OG. You know, he's OG leader, you know. Um, he, he's, he's experienced. He's smart. You know, he's a, he's a, a, a great, no-nonsense leader. And... Uh, one day he ran in, we ran into each other, and, and we, I, you know, I knew of him, and, and he knew of me, and, and, but we, we had never spent any time together. We were right out here in the, in the lobby, and, and, and we crossed paths, and, and he said, you know, Pastor Josh, I, I love when, when you preach. Uh, can we talk? I was like, hmm. <laughs> Sometimes that can mean, you know, like, but the fact that, you know, he, he said he wanted to talk in person and wasn't an email, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, all right, maybe, <laughs> all right, maybe, maybe this is good. But he invited me, he invited me to his house. And uh, we had a very unexpected conversation. And he said to me, he said, you know, I think I have something to learn from you. He, he said, what can the white man learn from the black man in your experience? And I'm like, whoa, I don't know what to do, man. You really want me to answer that? <laughs> man, you should have gave brother a little warning, you know. <laughs> And I, and I know we laugh, you know, but, but I, think, I think on the other end of that, like, that's triggering for some of us. Right, right. I think it's a little triggering for some of us because, like, oh, Lord, here we go again. We're talking about the black, white, the black. Oh, Lord, you know, like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it's still an issue, you know. It's not going anywhere, you know, in part because we ain't handling our business, but that's a whole separate message. Um, but it was a holy moment because we were intentionally stepping in each other into each other's world. And it wasn't unlawful, but it was unlikely. But you got two men of God, two men who pray, two men are open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, saying, hey, you know what, let's just get together and see what happens. And you know 
what happened. We both carry that moment and a couple of other moments into our circles of influence. And it wasn't just about two guys just coming together to say like, hey, well, maybe we should just hang out. No, God was up to something bigger than that. Just like he was up to something bigger with Peter and Cornelius. Because listen to what verse 44 and verse 45 says later on in the story. It says, while Peter was still speaking whatever he was saying, the Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. They both thought that it was about what God was going to say through Peter, but God interrupted Peter, cut him off, and said, hey, look, I'm up to something bigger, something greater. And everybody in the room was astonished. And then when you go to Acts 11, the very next chapter, the word hits the street. Oh, man, Peter, hang with Gentile. Lord, have mercy, Peter. Peter, what, what, man, tell us what, what's, what's happening, bro. That ain't what we do. Like, what? Peter, like, yo, 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 let me tell you, bro. Let me tell you how this thing went down. Let me tell you what's up. Let me tell you what God is up to. And they were like, word? <laughs> and Peter was like, word. <laughs> and then let me tell you, Acts 15 you go to Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Listen, this is a pivotal moment in all of the New Testament. And the question on the table was, hey, listen, can you follow Jesus and be a Gentile? Can you follow Jesus and be non-Jewish? And you know what testimony swung the whole thing? It was Peter. Peter stood up and said, yo, let me tell y'all how this thing is going down. And let me tell you that I've seen it, I've experienced it, and I know what God is doing. And there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And you know why it all happened? Because two men decided that they were going to be fully committed to God in prayer and pray regularly. Listen, God wants to be up to something greater, something bigger. But we got to be fully submitted to him in prayer. And we've got to move from this individualism. And we've got to move from guarding our preferences to allowing God to help us to become instruments of peace. And it's uncomfortable. But it's the holy moment that God wants us to step into. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given to us. Thank you for how you have given us encouragement today on what it means to be fully submitted to you in prayer and to trust that when you tell us to move, that you're up to something beyond what is comfortable or uncomfortable for us. God, I believe that in a city where division is just kind of normal and what people expect, and either you're on this side or you're on this side, that there will be a remnant of people right here on this corner of Capitol Hill who represent what it means to be unified, who represents what it means to be fully submitted to the God of the universe who says that I care about all of my creation. I pray, God, that you would show us, you would help us, you would lead us, you would guide us, you would give us the courage, and you would help us to be instruments of peace. In Jesus' name, amen.